Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we're going to discuss visceral leishmaniasis caused by Leishmania donovani and Leishmania infantum. Most of visceral leishmaniasis is caused by Leishmania donovani, but as we'll see, infantum plays a role in this infection, in, in infectious disease as well. The geographic distribution for visceral leishmaniasis is more restricted than cutaneous leishmaniasis, obviously, because this map would be uh, mostly red if it were just cutaneous. But we can see now we have very, very narrow foci of infections found throughout South Asia, China, Europe, the Mediterranean Basin, some parts of East Africa, and of course, some portions of South America as well. A few spotted regions up through Central America that defines the geographic distribution for visceral leishmaniasis. It has a rich history of discovery, actually. It's worth at least explaining how, how it got its name, because these organisms have very interesting names. And in this case, the name uh, Leishmania donovani was given uh, by Sir Ronald Ross uh, in that, in those days, known as just Ronald Ross, <laughs> had yet to be knighted, um, serving as the editor-in-chief for the British Medical Journal. He received two papers at various times, not so close together. These were, were actually three years apart, but each one had the same kind of data. One was from Leishman in um, western uh, northern India, and the other was from Donovan, another physician uh, not working in the British Medical Service at that time, uh, who was there uh, at another port of India, and both of them in their observations of both uh, the clinical aspects and the microscopic diagnostic aspects described exactly the same organism, unbeknownst to each other. They submitted their papers separately. <clears throat> Ross was uh, astute enough to recognize the fact that they had both identified the same entity and ended up dubbing it uh, Leishmania in honor of Leishman, Donovani in honor of Donovan. So that's how it got its name. Back to the vectors, of course, in this case, the vectors are no different than they were before for the other Leishmania. We have phlebotomous species in the old world, Lutzomyia species in the new world. And they're all capable of transmitting all forms of Leishmaniasis. So the life cycle for Leishmania donovani differs remarkably from the other two, two entities that we discussed before, cutaneous stays in the skin, mucocutaneous stays at the mucocutaneous dermal junctions. Leishmania donovani is just the opposite of those two. The organism gains entrance to the host through the bite of a, an infected sand fly, the promastigotes are introduced. All of those things go on uh, in the skin as it did for the other Leishmania species, and then things change. At that point, these macrophages migrate from the area of infection in the skin and transfer the infection throughout the body. This particular uh, form of leishmaniasis has the ability to invade all kinds of phagocytic cells, including Kupfer cells, for instance, um, fixed macrophages of various kinds. Uh, the spleen is loaded with them, and of course, this is a major source of attack for the organism. And it infects most of the organs that contain large collections of phagocytic cells. As the result, there's a lot of replication, tissue damage, replication, tissue damage, replication, tissue damage. Sounds simple. It's horrible in terms of its outcome. Because if untreated, Leishmania donovani is 80% fatal. No matter what age, uh, of the uh, host we're talking about, children, young adults, old adults, it doesn't really matter. If, if left untreated, it's 80% mortality rate. So it's considered very serious where it does exist. And as we'll see, the reason for that involves the fact that the drugs are very toxic as well. There are reservoir hosts here too. So peridomestic animals like dogs uh, and other um, 
domesticated animals, such as goats and sheep and pigs, can all acquire this infection from sand flies, as well as desert-dwelling animals that we associate more with, let's say, Lishmania tropica, for instance, in the Middle East. Uh, we can find Lishmania donovani in those same animals in that, in that instance as well. The infection is then acquired by an uninfected sand fly simply by taking another blood meal from an infected individual. These are circulating macrophages that are taken up by the sand fly. The macrophages are digested in the stomach of the sand fly, releasing the amastigotes. The amastigotes then transform eventually into the promastigotes that are infectious for the next host. We see also depicted here a consequence of of partial therapy or a particular genetic background which does not allow complete resolution of the infection. And as a result, we have something called post kela azar dermal leishmanoid reaction. The word kela azar is a Hindu word for black lesion. And this results in a black lesion eventually under the skin in places where you have certain collections of macrophages. The skin darkens and uh, it's associated with a heavy infection from Lishmania donovani. Clinical disease is very serious. Uh, if you have a patient uh, exhibiting a long-term infection with this, let's say months of dealing with Lishmania donovani, you can palpate the spleen, you can palpate the liver, so both hepatosplenomegaly is, is a typical uh, way of including this patient into the diagnosis. And now Dr. Daniel Griffin is going to give a clinical vignette illustrating the pathogenesis of this infection. This is a 45-year-old male from Assam, India. He comes in with a 16-year history of fever, um, mild but increasing abdominal pain, darkening of the skin, some yellowing of the eyes. He reports that the fever is every other day. All right, so let's look at a few features. He's from Assam, India, so there's gonna be certain diseases that are prevalent in that area. 16 year history, this has been going on for a very long time and he's still alive, so that, that's important. He has darkening of the skin um, and the fever is every other day just so people have a sense of where Assam is. Um, you can see that it is, it's interesting, it's this sort of extension area up in uh, the northeast part of India. It's actually, here's Bangladesh, but India's kind of wrapping around it there. Uh, and here is our gentleman, he's laying here um, in, in the bed, in the hospital in southern India where I'm seeing him. And on exam, he has hepatosplenomegaly. Now his liver is quite enlarged. Normally we would expect a spleen edge to, I mean a liver edge to be a here, but his liver edge is extending all the way down to here. I'm actually um, percussing it so that I get a sense of the upper because you can actually um, palpate through the ribs there. Uh, the spleen is quite large. A normal spleen would be sort of tucked in here, but as you can see, this is a very large uh, spleen relative to what should just be in this area. Let's talk about the several clinical presentations of uh, visceral leishmaniasis. We have adult acquired, congenital, and then this post calaazar dermal leishmaniasis. Now, as far as um, adult acquired, you can have enlargement of the liver and spleen, hepatosplenomegaly. You can have muscle wasting. You can have jaundice, uh, which might be described as the patient as yellowing of the eyes or the skin. You can end up with dermal ulcers, ulcers on the skin. You can have fevers, um, and these have various um, sort of chronicities to them. Over time, you have a darkening of the skin, which actually is where the name Kala Azar comes from, the darkening fever. Um, you can have anemia, which is uh, a low level of your red cells, as well as thrombocytopenia, where your platelets are low. And there, there tends to be this, this generalized um, rise in your immunoglobulin subclass G levels, just a, a broad uh, response. Now, the congenital form has a lot of the same features that would be described for the adult, um, but a, a less common 
and probably most important for transmission um, subtype is the post calaazar dermal leishmaniasis. And this is often an issue where someone has been treated, there's been a tr drug failure, and now they come in with this erythematous macular papular, so sort of small area, larger area um, rash. Uh, in a lot of areas, when you see this, um, other people in the area might have similar rashes, which actually would be a lepromatous leprosy, so it can resemble that. Um, they can have ocular manifestations, but the concern is that the, these areas can be teeming with the um, parasites and could potentially be a, a really important factor in the spread of this disease through these communities. Now, what about diagnosis? Uh, the definitive diagnosis um, of visceral leishmaniasis depends upon isolation of the organism um, or using nucleic acid amplification tests. The, um, the diffuse cutaneous form um, can also be diagnosed um, by using nucleic, ac nucleic acid amplification testing. Um, where do you get your specimens? Now, the specimens um, have historically been described as coming from bone marrow or splenic aspiration, and I'm going to make a little comment here. Splenic aspiration is is with risk. It is not without risk. And when they've actually looked at the um, the frequency of complications, it's higher than I think people would um, would have thought originally. So what a lot of people have suggested, and I'll make this suggestion as well, is doing repeated large volume bone marrow aspirations, and when possible, avoiding the risks associated with splenic aspiration. Um, once you have these samples, they can be sent for culture microscopic evaluation, and again, nucleic acid amplification testing. Now, the culture of the bone marrow aspirates um, is um, effective at uh, revealing the organisms in, in some cases, but it can take several days. Um, when you finally amplify them up, maybe the parasites can, can be seen. Um, but there is this delay, um, and um, maybe in our case, this really this man's been sick for 16 years. So three or four days um, might actually, might be reasonably clinically as far as a delay. Um, what about additional tests? There are a number of tests that were used historically, serum antibody, urine antigen, there was even a Leishmanin test, which is sort of similar to the tuberculosis test where you're injecting under the skin, you're waiting to see a, a, a bump, a hypersensitivity reaction. But now in their place, a highly sensitive and highly specific lateral flow assay called the RK39 antigen um, ELISA is available. And this is a simple point of care test and allows you to uh, make this diagnosis. And it, it's an antigen test. So you're not just asking, has this person be, been exposed? You're actually looking for verification that the organism and, and antigens from that organism are present in your patient. Um, here we've got this um, really a beautiful uh, picture of um, specimens under the microscope, and you can see the parasites here. A lot more um, aesthetically pleasing than just getting a uh, report or a line on a, uh, on a test. Here is um, a positive culture. Some labs have the ability to do that, as mentioned, taking um, a minimum a few days. And this, the RK39, um, which is really um, a great test, it's very easy to do, where you have um, basically these lines. And so you're going to use this to detect circulating um, antigen. And of course, um, something that is changing many of our diagnostics, the ability to do nucleic acid amplification tests. What about treatment? Now, um, the therapeutic treatments for visceral leishmaniasis actually vary based upon the geography and the particular uh, manifestation we're seeing, as well as um, HIV status and subspecies. So let me go through this. As far as parenteral therapy, uh, the liposomal amphotericin uh, is, is really an ideal um, treatment when you can do it. Uh, and this is one that's used uh, quite often in India. But when you move to Africa, you start seeing more use of the pentavalent antimonials. Part of this is an issue that we're seeing failures in India with the pantovalent antimonials. And that may have something to do with um, differences in, in resistance and uh, leishmania organisms in that part of the world. Uh, standard old amphotericin is used as well. It's uh, less expensive, but the lip liposomal amphotericin is better tolerated. And in many areas when um, the resources are available, it's a preferred drug. Now, miltefazine, which is a 
uh, medicine that we use for sometimes mucocutaneous and quite often for uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis and I'll say um, areas where resources are not particularly limited because this is still a very expensive medicine, um, it's a non-preferred alternative. It, it's usually not something that we would be recommending, um, but sometimes it will be brought in as a combination therapy. And there actually are some um, efforts being made to look at shortening the duration of um, liposomal amphotericin by combining it with miltefazine. And this shows us this uh, wonderful liposome with amphotericin B. Uh, the, the concept behind this is that the liposomal amphotericin is gonna penetrate better into the immune cells. So we're gonna get better delivery with less toxicity. The sodium stibagluconate, uh, which is still, I would say, um, a primary approach in Africa, in particularly. But what about post calizar dermal leishmaniasis? This is the tough one, because this is an issue for the patient, but it may be more of an issue from a public health standpoint, because these are considered by many people to be the super spreaders. Uh, in general, it's a uh, similar drugs, but longer duration. And what about our patient? Now, our patient had an RK39 dipstick that was positive. He still went ahead and had a large volume bone marrow aspirate. This was PCR positive and culture positive for leish, Leishmania Donovani. Patient was treated with liposomal amphotericin and he did well. Much better to prevent and control than it is to treat. Again, if you're visiting an area which is known to have endemic visceral leishmaniasis, Maybe a game park in northern India, for instance, very popular with, with certain groups of people. Um, you have to be aware of the fact that it, the potential for catching this organism is very high at certain times of the year. The use of DEET, sleeping under insecticides and pregnated bed nets are your best approach for that. Again, avoid activities at the peak biting times for sandflies early morning, late evening. Difficult to explain to your guide that you don't want to go out on an evening walk to see the elephants coming down to feed at the uh, the water hole uh, or to try to spot a tiger on their way to a kill. Um, it's very interesting and uh, easy to resist uh, such recommendations from a parasitologist. Ah, you know, it's probable that I won't catch it. It's probably true, but I'm, I'm not sure what I would do in those situations. Vaccines, again, for leishmaniasis in general show promise whether any of them will actually make it to the light of day in terms of commercial products that safe to use, easy to formulate, and widely accepted, uh, that's yet another thing entirely. And we are nowhere near that point yet in the development of vaccines. Uh, there are, of course, uh, lots of articles always being written about this to bring you up to date in terms of uh, what the uh, latest status is for these vaccines. And so here's a good reference that I've found for you. So the next time we meet, we'll discuss the trypanosomes, the other group of kinetoplastidae, which have a devastating effect on humans living in Africa. Thanks for listening.